I want to dig deep this week on uh, the bikini body blueprint. So how you actually need to train and whatnot. More often than not, we see a lot of girls coming in a gym and training like guys. And uh, especially if they are kind of exposed to casual gym PT, so to speak. Like in UK, for example, when you learn to become a personal trainer, it's ridiculous. Hey, you need to ask your clients, they are one RMs and you to need to check in this and that. Some of those clients have never even squatted before, never mind checking their one RM. So it's like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And they understand, uh, they definitely don't ask them about what's their actual outcome, what, where they want to go. And if you ask somebody, hey, I want to be building bikini style physique, you don't need to do one RM. <laughs> it's just, it's just absolutely useless. So uh, what would be your map for assessing muscles to begin with and do you even do that kind of thing where you go like okay this body part is overpowering we definitely need to bring up these things we probably don't need to do i don't know bench press or something like that but you already are very powerful in your shoulders so we're going to focus more on this and that uh so give me a breakdown of essential muscle groups that should be trained when you're trying to achieve that feminine hourglass so to speak look well to, for the categories they're looking to have that hourglass shape so you want to have a streamed waistline with you know shoulders that have some muscular development and then glutes quads hamstrings etc um the bikini category on stage i always tell my clients to think of themselves standing behind a sheet, like a silhouette. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Austin Powers movies where, you know, he's in the tent and it looks like he's pulling those fucking things out of his ass through the shadows. Of the tent. So like, you want to see that silhouette and that's what your job is to build is create that silhouette of the category you're looking for. Um, so it's always going to be shoulders and glutes, shoulders and glutes, which is why it's what you're seeing mostly women training constantly as well, usually glutes. Um, but a feminine physique might require something else that depends on the individual but if it's literally to kind of build that blueprint bikini body i'm putting a lot of emphasis on those muscle groups the lateral delt glutes minimus maximus and medius you got to stimulate all to get full development and then quads and hamstrings halves etc everything really should be try to be proportionate so what would you say workout that works you you just mentioned lateral delts and what that whatnot so would there be any kind of shoulder pressing involved at all oftentimes i will do i shouldn't say oftentimes sometimes i will do shoulder presses um the thing is is with every exercise it really comes down to the individual and their anatomical variances we're trying to stimulate a muscle lots of exercises can stimulate the muscle so now my job is to choose the best one for the individual a lot of overhead pressing is problematic for shoulder health for certain individuals if i have a female professional that works in an office sitting most of the day she most likely is going to have some adaptation that will occur in her shoulders and she might have a bit of an anterior rotated shoulder um, to start doing overhead pressing constantly with her is just going to cause more problems. So it wouldn't be a good option. Um, but there could be an overhead press. It's definitely a, a viable tool. But like everything else, I think you have to choose the right exercise for the individual to stimulate the target muscle. If I just want to predominantly get that lateral head or that medial head, I'm going to be doing some sort of raise to the side. Um, and typically, I do more raises for shoulder development than I do overhead pressing for most females just because of shoulder problems. Um, but again, it comes down to them and their individuality. And this is what I see a lot, that uh, people mis misunderstand sometimes what I put on my training plans for people that I work with. I'm not necessarily putting things in to build the tissue because my goal mm -hmm. is always to make them move better. And what you just mm -hmm. described, a lot of people now are just office bound and they don't understand that, hey, maybe throwing in an exercise that puts you in a really awkward position will not build any muscle, but might improve your posture and things like that. But also what we mentioned at the beginning is that a lot of girls come in the gym and then they start training with their boyfriends or someone they just met. 
and they just take them through the sessions that they do, which for female most likely is not optimal, and sometimes it's just outward wrong. Uh, so, what yeah. what other so, things would you say uh, would be essential to consider for a female who is trying to achieve that feminine physique uh, as exercise choice, and maybe then uh, dwell deeper into how about sets, how about reps, and all those kind of things. I think one of the, um, I don't want to say misconceptions, but one of the things I'm seeing overly done in bikini athletes is core training. They're constantly doing obsessive amounts of abs, weighted crunches, rope crunches, Russian twists, what, you name it, um, to bring out that six pack. At a higher body fat percentage, you will see visible abs if they are bigger. So if you've de overdeveloped your midsection, you'll see them sooner than later um, because it's a bigger muscle. But you're also creating a bigger circumference of your waist. And if you think of that silhouette scenario, that's counterproductive to the end goal. I don't think women need to be doing as much core work as they think. My opinion on core training is I need to have adequate muscularity or muscular development in the core to stabilize the spine to do the amounts of lifting of the exercise I need to build the physique. I don't need more. And especially if females are enhanced, every rep counts. So they could be doing weighted crunches and they could be growing their midsection half an inch in an off season and not even realizing it just because they can grow that much easier on anabolics or on performance enhancing drugs. And so oftentimes they're building their shoulders, building a six pack and building their glutes. And the whole time they're not changing their proportions at all. They're just getting bigger everywhere. And that's sort of counterproductive long-term. So that's one of the things I think needs to be considered. Um, how much core training do you really need? Your abs are there. Your job is to reveal them via your energy balance, like lose some body fat. You don't need to necessarily build them bigger. Some people do, but most people I don't think do. And if they knew that it was actually making their waist bigger over time, I think a lot of people be like, shit, no, I didn't want to do that. But they have this misconception that that's how you'll see a six pack is building my abs. You do need to have some muscularity there, but that's more diet related. I, I believe that's more understand your goal. If you want to be yes. stronger, athletic and whatnot, yeah, okay, hit your core hard. But for yeah. bikini, uh, I think distinction needs to be made. If you are training for bikini, you don't need to be athletic. <laughs> yes, That's aesthetic right. training is that sport. It's it's just changing the way you look. Absolutely, that goes. I think that takes us back to like our very first video, which is like understand your goal. Like it's super crucial, the details of your goal. Like you just said, like if you're a performance athlete, if you look at a powerlifter or a combat athlete, they're very rectangular looking in their midsection because they've got a ton of core strength because they need it you don't need it on stage if you're just posing in an outfit so how about waist trainers do you ever implement any of those uh because some use it with great success some completely ignore them what what is your stance and do you have have you ever used them with anyone or have you ever told anyone who uses them no you don't shouldn't be doing it i don't believe a waist trainer is helping them at all for what they think it's doing. Um, I often hear, oh yeah, I wear my waist trainer, my waist is smaller, this, 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 this. You are putting an abnormal amount of heat in an area, which is gonna change body water. You take that thing off. I've literally seen a female take her waist trainer off and like it looked like a bucket of water poured out. Like you can very, very acutely change the shape of something, but it's just gonna come right back. Unless you have been doing that for, you know, since birth kind of idea. So I'm not a fan of waist trainers. I don't think it's helping them for making their waist smaller, but I do believe they're relevant. When I have an enhanced athlete or an enhanced female, and like we talked about how anabolics make you grow. I mean, the machine paper shows that you grow even bedridden people grow muscle. Mm. So if I have a female using um, performance enhancing drugs, I encourage her to wear a belt, not necessarily a waist trainer, but an actual belt. And the reason is, is I wanna provide mechanical stability around her waist 
So the brain is sensing stability. And therefore, when she's bending over to pick up a weight or picking up her gym bag or when she's just moving about, her brain has a sense of stability and doesn't need to over contract the core muscles to stabilize the spine because the brain will do that subconsciously. It's a protective mechanism. And if you're constantly contracting your core muscles all the time on your drugs, they will grow. So I will have them wear a belt for mechanical stability to help reduce the amount of involuntary muscle contractions that are happening in their core. It sounds nitpicky, but over the course of five years, you'll save an inch or maybe more of growth around a midsection that you wouldn't even know is happening. Um, and then the other reason I might encourage it is if it helps them remember some sort of contraction or cue to, you know, contract when they're doing a movement that needs more stability. Um, but in terms of just making their waist, you know, shrink, it's not. And I don't believe for a second it is. And I've never seen research that shows otherwise. So I'm not a believer of that. Yeah, I, I believe that was also the purpose why uh, Joe Weider told Ronnie Coleman start wearing a belt because you're so goddamn strong. And yeah, you can handle all the poundage without waist, uh, without any belt, but it's just going to make you blocky. So yeah. what about sets, reps, and technique? How how much consideration need to be uh, put on those? Because we, we see a lot of studies and, hey, do as long as you come close to failure and do this and do that. And when uh, it might be completely different for someone who is just starting out, for someone who has athletic background, you know, someone with athletic background, I would not tell them do 50 reps until you fail. It's just nonsense. Uh, so what, what's your thoughts uh, and what's your experience on what is that? Is there an optimal rep range? Are there optimal sets? And what about technical stuff? How much effort should someone who's just starting out put into understanding what the muscle actually does to get the most out of the movement? Well, when it comes to that, I think it, for me, the way I look at it is, again, I take the individual into consideration. And if we are a natural athlete, I'm going to want to prioritize intensity as in the weight on the bar. That is the biggest signal or biggest stimulus for muscle growth. So that's going to be the priority. Um, and then the rep range Again, there's quite a bit of research showing that it's the, you know, the last five, six, it's a controversial number, but five, six reps in proximity to failure seem to be the ones that are recruiting the high threshold motor units and therefore getting the most amount of fiber recruitment, muscle fiber recruitment. So I want them to be getting at least, you know, six, seven, eight ish reps. If they're natural, I pretty much am almost always going to cap them at that six to eight rep range. And I want them using a weight or an intensity that they actually are failing at that rep range. Not that they're stopping because it says six to eight on your on the program. Um, the other thing that I do differently is when I say fail, I don't mean muscular failure. I mean, as you pointed out, technique breakdown. If I am building a silhouette and I'm trying to target the lateral delt, I want that lateral delt to get fatigued. And when the lateral delt is fatigued and all of a sudden you're swaying, I don't want you doing it anymore. You've done the job. Swaying now is just going to start building the opposite side oblique or, or whatever movement you're doing. I don't want momentum involved. So when I'm literally building an aesthetic physique, I'm talking about technique failure or you know form breakdown or however you want to word it. I'm not talking about complete muscular failure especially in a natural, because they're just not going to recover very well. So I'm going to have a natural athlete working in that six, eight rep range until technique breakdown. Um, I don't really want the technique to break down. So I want you to stop, you know, a rep before or, you know, an RPE nine or RIR one or whatever, you know, language people are using. I basically want every rep to be identical and then that's it. Then when you get into the enhanced people, I think it, the games change completely. I think all that goes right out the window. Almost the intensity doesn't even matter anymore. You can just rep upon rep upon rep, and you'll just grow, 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 grow. It's the magic of these drugs, and, and you can recover from them. But from the principle of it all, I would sooner see the intensity as the primary driver and the natural athlete. Um, and then 
possibly volume via sets and reps for the enhanced athlete. And in terms of, is there an optimal? Um, there probably is for each individual and it's going to be highly individual. So what I do is I actually test all my clients um, depending on where they are. Usually I test them right off the beginning within reason. If they're a brand new lifter, I don't, but if they've been lifting and usually Usually someone that is now ready to try a competition, they're not just starting to lift weights at the same time. It's usually been lifting a little bit, but I want to kind of gauge their, where they are as a lifter. And I just use strength standards and, you know, rate your lifts and compared to the tens of thousands of people that they've studied on. And if you score a novice, then I give you volume that in theory, a novice can recover from. If you score an elite then I would give you the volume that in theory an elite level athlete would recover from. And then I monitor your recovery every week and I adjust based on real world results. I and think somebody that's the find these through. numbers somewhere. So, so if somebody wanted to check themselves, hey, how how do I compare for the rest of the world? Is there a website or anything like that where they can have a look? Yep. Yep. It is strength standards. The one I use, I mean, there's different ones. Um, it's just How do I send you this link? It's exrx.net. Right. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll put in the description. Link it in here, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And literally, you, you'll be able to choose the, the gender, male, female, weight, like how heavy you are, pick your exercise, and just take a look at it. It's not the holy Bible, but it's really, 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 really Will, will really they have something like started. lateral raises and uh, cable glute kickbacks? The, the, I don't know if they'll get that fancy, but they'll have a wide variety of exercises. Um, and then they'll rate you between untrained, novice, intermediate, advanced, elite. And then I can tell you right off the bat, in two decades of coaching, even though every single bodybuilder thinks they're elite, I've never met one ever when it comes to their actual lifting abilities. I've I've seen a few elite level athletes. None of them are bodybuilders. Um, it's not how long you've been in the gym. It's how well are you able to, you know, basically utilize that muscle. That's what they're scoring here. And that's determining how much can we stress that muscle and how much will it need to recover from that stress? That's basically what we're determining with that. So to me, that's the best right out of the gate ballpark idea. And then once I have that in play, I just monitor how the progress is going and I adjust accordingly. Sometimes you have to double their volume sometimes you have to scale it back but usually it's pretty accurate so how do you assess their recovery ability is there something that you can put your kind of finger on and like okay we did this last let's say on monday and they come back on wednesday you go oh you know what we, we can carry on and do the same exact stuff so uh what is there for someone who is doing it on, on their own to to look for how let's say women just want to train glutes every day so they, they recover quicker than men anyway, but how do you assess that you have recovered quicker, that you are ready to push again? And how important mm -hmm. is uh, the post-workout recovery and all the methods? What, what would you even involved into helping recover quicker? I think the recovery ability is, um, for individuals is obviously very, very individual, but it's very important that people are looking into their recovery. Um, if they're wearing, and a lot of people do now wear these fancy gadgets, I think your heart rate recovery, um, your heart rate variability is a decent recovery marker, um, as well as your resting heart rate. Um, but what I do with my clients is there's not really one metric that I think is the sole determining factor that, hey, you're recovered or no, you're not. Um, you can wear an HRV monitor and it can show that you're completely recovered and you could have the worst training session ever because mm -hmm. there's just not a ton of accurate data showing that, yes, this is an excellent tool for an acute measurement of recovery. It's monitoring a trend and you have to be using this thing for weeks and weeks to get a, an idea of what that trend is showing. And then it can be utilized very accurately. Um, but I like to have them. I have my clients. Um, Fill out a checklist. Um, I, I have like their mood, their, their mental clarity, energy. I'm reading it right off the thing right now. Sleep quality, their stress levels, their muscle soreness, joint pain, their digestion, their training session, their hydration, their hunger, libido, and their uh, resting heart rate. And I have them score that. 
on a one to 10 for me every day. And I just watch that trend. And if your recovery is starting to get hindered, you're going to see clarity going down, energy going down, sleep quality going down, stress going up, resting heart rate going up, HRV going down. All these different things will start to trend in a certain direction as showing like, hey, we're pushing the body here. Um, you can use just the next training session as an indicator, but it's not always accurate. You could be completely under recovered and have a fantastic one-off training session it happens all the time but then two or three days later you could just be completely wiped out so i don't typically say yeah if you hit this that's training session you're good to go but what i do generally do is i'll give a client a range i want you to train in the six to eight reps i want you to determine a weight that you can lift six times and leave that weight there and work that weight each time you repeat that training session until you get into around eight now you've accumulated a couple extra reps with the same weight. Now I want you to increase the weight again, bring the reps back down and just kind of do this like escalating, um, undulating model where like reps kind of go up and then stay, then load goes up. Hmm. And then I'm just monitoring it weekly. But typically if you have a bad training session, I still wouldn't change anything. If you've had two bad training sessions in a row, you might want to start taking a look at lifestyle things like are you sleeping are you feeding yourself properly are you well hydrated is work or life excessively stressful lately if all those things are still fine you might want to take a look at the train if a third train session is not ideal something's wrong and you need to look at the probably the overall volume and back off somewhere it's really hard to say a one thing though it, it really yeah. does depend on so many factors and, and uh, from, from what I observe personally is that more often than not, it's not what you did in a gym, but what you, you did outside the gyms that affects you. And you can specifically see that in competitors, if their personal life has changed, for example, they split up or whatever, you know, re relationships broke apart, their physique on stage will be so part of that what it was before. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and what you kind of highlighted, HRV, rest and heart rate and all those kind of things. Yes, they are great predictor, but what I have observed myself, if I feel tired, I have a negotiation with myself that I'm going to make this the hardest session I've ever had. And usually end up having a great rating session, even though I went in, I didn't even want to be there. Uh, so it's more of a psychology. So uh, that's that's, yep. that's quite great. What what I always elucidate to, to all my people that I work with, we don't just check your body weight. But to me, that's the least important part. We are checking your mental state. That's the number one. And then everything else, and your resting heart rate, your heart rate variability, and all those kind of things, because you can change your resting heart rate and heart rate variability just by being excited. Mm -hmm. So if your head is not clear, you everything is, is is off the charts. And and if I don't understand how you feel, and if you don't understand how you feel, you might look on those numbers and start stressing even more. And now you yep. just go like downward spiral, so to speak. So yep, is totally. there? Anything in regards to nutrition or things like that that they can do, uh, I'm more focused on post-recovery immediately that might enhance their recovery abilities uh, before uh, we start talking about pre-workouts and all those kind of things. Because recovery um, is more important than... Uh, I think the, the, the most important thing to bring about the best options or the best ability to recover is get your body into a parasympathetic state as quickly as you can post-training. So Often what does it mean like, in your terms and how do you do it quickly in a gym? What I often tell, and tell my clients is your heart rate going into your training session, I don't want you leaving the gym until your heart rate's back there again. So that means after you've done all your training, go sit down, go do a light walk, do whatever, if you're if you need to be doing some stretching, which I'm not a huge advocate of typically for bikini, uh, but if I need you doing something, I'm just trying to get you to bring your heart rate down, and encourage that uh, parasympathetic system to sort of take charge here and bring that sympathetic system down. That's the number one thing in trying to bring about recovery is getting the systems here online. There's never parasympathetic or sympathetic are never on or off. They're always overlapped, but one is primarily on or engaged versus the other. And so bringing your breathing, controlling your breathing, bringing everything down is a good way to bring about the beginnings of that recovery ability. And then from there, obviously, proper nutrition is crucial. 
Um, like the, the worst thing you can be doing as a bikini athlete, which unfortunately they're doing all the time, is never never eating carbs and doing nothing but aerobic activity constantly all the time. I just was referred a wellness female um, who was doing, not via me, via her previous coach, four hours of cardio wow. seven days a week, no carbs. Like you couldn't ask for a worse recipe for down the road problems. Like that girl's going to be digging herself out of a physiological hole that's quite deep. Um, so I would say get your heart rate down after training session back to about where it was when you got there. And then post new post uh, workout nutrition is always important. Always. And I think what you just mentioned there is that not doing a lot of, I, I see a lot of times that the girls specifically fall for this is that I'm going to get in shape by doing cardio and then I'm going to come and train some muscle. But in reality, building lean muscle tissue is what's going to help you to lose that body fat and mm -hmm. make your body more efficient in absorbing the nutrients you put in. So mm -hmm. this is why someone my size can get away with going away for a week and I come back not bigger than everyone else when they go on holiday. I actually lose weight because I have so much tissue to, to feed, kind of, so to speak. Uh, yep. you, you just mentioned that you're not fan of uh, stretching and whatnot. So how important is flexibility and some something like balanced training for bikini athletes? I think that always will come down again to the goal. If somebody comes to me and literally their only goal is to look good in a bikini on stage or whatever, the amount of flexibility they need is determined by the poses that they have to hit. Other than that, they don't need any more. Want is different. Need is different. So how much flexibility and mobility do they need? They need to be able to do the exercises that I need them to do to build the silhouette. And they need to be able to pose the way that the category requires that. Aside from that, if they have that amount of flexibility and mobility, they don't need any more. There's nothing wrong with flexibility. It's quite important. But there's this, there's a point of no return here stability and mobility are antagonists you, you can't have them both completely you have to choose eventually you don't see a lot of power lifters working on excessive joint range mobility and you know they don't want to be super flexible because they'll just crush they'll be crushed under their weights i they think unless adequate... they already had that ground before they started doing power lifting then they might kind of carry on and that's not going to interfere with it Right. You need to have the amount of stability and flexibility you need to do your job. You don't need any more. If you want more, that's up to the individual. And realistically, most people, it's not going to become a problem. But if you were an elite level athlete and you started to mix together modalities of flexibility, mobility and, and stability training, you'd have a mixing pot and you would be a less lesser of an athlete because of that. Um, but that's the elite level people. I think a bikini athlete should be able to do her everyday life without aches and pains. And that's all they need. If they need more flexibility than that, that that's a that's a want. And then from there, we just address that based on everything else. So larger breakdown of everything you just went through is, okay, if you are a girl who wants to look more or less like a bikini, our time standard bikini physique, not the ones that was in 70s, 80s, and 60s. Uh, so you focus predominantly on some shoulder cap, which might be counterintuitive that you don't do any pressing, you just do a lot of lateral raising and stuff. And predominantly Maybe, yeah. glutes. Uh, don't overemphasize core training because it can actually take away from building that physique or you will end up chasing size because you are now misunderstanding what's happening with your body. You don't realize that you are building thicker waist and you just want to get bigger, bigger, bigger now. And we, we see that quite, quite often now that girls are just getting, getting huge for the sake of getting big. Uh, but that necessarily means they are looking like bikini girls anymore. Recovery. That's right. So you're right. That's why you're seeing the, you're you're totally right. That's why you're seeing these categories getting more and more and more extreme. Like yeah. the bikini girls now are are quite muscular. Like I have some female clients that don't want to be as muscular as a bikini athlete on stage. Like once upon a time, that was just not a thing. But there's a lot of girls now like that's too much muscle for me. And you know, my job is to give them their goal. So I, I that's fine. No problem. Yeah. So workouts should be 
still on intensity based uh, kind of outcome rather than trying to uh, just hit reps for as as many reps as you can? I, I think with a female, it's again, if, if they're a natural athlete, it's crucial that they're doing some strength training. Not only is it, is it the best stimulus for muscle growth, but it's also going to preserve bone mineral density for long-term health. Mm. You're going to get that from strength training in that 80, 85% rep max range. You're not going to get that from reps of 15s and 20s um, unless you're enhanced. An enhanced bikini athlete will get muscular growth because of the anabolics. The muscle stretch the muscle size will stretch and stress the bone enough to signify some adaptations but if you're not enhanced reps of 12s and 15s you're going to grow like slower than paint drying with a natural athlete you've got to be putting load on the bar to get that muscular adaptation and that gives that bone mineral density um, benefit as well which is crucial for a female long term and this is probably the biggest takeaway is that anyone should uh, understand that if you are looking for advice from a bikini pro, uh, she's probably enhanced. What she is doing, there is a chance that it's not going to work for you. And I would go as far as also apply it to men as well. That you're listening to the biggest guy in the gym whilst not doing what biggest guy in the gym does. It's just not going to work. So, 100%. Yeah. And, and what you yeah. also kind of uh, elucidated is that uh, flexibility, balance, and all those kind of things for someone who wants to change their aesthetics is uh, more or less just a waste of time. So if you want to focus on one thing, focus on one thing only, instead of trying to glorify some kind of practices that are maybe on social media just for attention, because they're not really giving anything uh, for the time invested. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're in that era where social media and the attention is a big driving factor of what people are doing in the gym. Um, and that's fine. They can do that, but that doesn't make them right. And the body is still going to show you what you're doing to it over time. Um, and if you're constantly stressing joints to the end range, you're going to run into a problem when you load them with heavy weight. If you need to be loading them with heavy weight to get the adaptations you need and you've made them the laxity in that joint so severe, you're going to get injured. I mean, that's just not my opinion that, that this is what happens. So unfortunately, there is this biological tipping point that we all have to respect. And I think it's important that the goal is clear so we can you know, design the appropriate training mm -hmm. so that you don't cross that tipping point or you'll reap the problems that come with it. So what would be your general advice for girls who want to kind of start building a bikini body? Uh, would it be something, mine would be stop training with your boyfriend because bench yes. presses are not going to bring you anywhere <laughs> unless yes. your boyfriend wants to bring massive glutes and shoulders and narrow waist. Uh, you're just wasting each other's time. I, I would say stop listening to your boyfriend uh, altogether. Yeah, probably. Um, I would say prioritize strength training versus over cardio. Cardio is not going to build you any muscle uh, unless you're an obese, sedentary person that's never done anything. You'll get some anabolic benefit from cardio. Somebody lifting in the gym for uh, bikini, they're not. Um, you want to spend more time prioritizing the muscle. That is the key. That's what's changing your shape. The only way to change the shape of a muscle is to make it bigger or smaller. You make it bigger by lifting. You don't make it bigger by running on a treadmill or a, a stairmaster. Yeah, you're not going to look like a feminine physique by never training those feminine muscles, so to speak. No. And and you're not going to get bulky lifting weights. The, the reason that women get to that bodybuilding, masculinizing size is drugs. Mm. Uh, a lot of drugs, actually. If you're not taking those or you're taking them very responsibly, responsibly or, you know, and very moderately, you're not going to get to that point it, it's going to take way 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 longer than you think um lifting weights doesn't make you bulky lifting weights is what builds muscle building muscle helps burn body fat building muscle is what changes the shape and creates that silhouette building muscle is what helps preserve bone density like building muscle does it all cardio is just a very inefficient way of burning energy you know if to burn 100 calories takes you 15 20 minutes you know a tablespoon of peanut butter takes two seconds to throw it out you know, like, where's your priority in time here? I, I think uh, cardio is being excessively overdone for this think this thinking that that's how you're going to get to the bikini look. 
And usually what you see is girls that live on the treadmills, they just look skinny on stage and they get beaten by someone that's developed a physique. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Scott. And uh, I'll speak to you next video. Okay, thanks. Sounds good.